You're listening to Straight Shooters, a straightforward golf podcast that'll straighten out your game. And here are your hosts, Keith Bennett and Henry Statina. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Straight Shooters podcast. We've got a real one percenter, a real legend in the building today. This guy lives it, breathes it, eats it, sleeps it. And uh, we're fortunate to have him on the episode to talk a little about golf life. Uh, consistency, longevity, mindset, uh, creating the shot, creating the moment. Um, without further ado, Mr. Jeff Costin, thank you for joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to speaking with you. Man, you know, um, you're going to make a teacher out of me yet, man, or somebody is. I <laughs> came for a long time and I love this game. I just played in another tournament today. I'm trying to stay young from the neck down, as you know that I say that a lot. And, um, <laughs> I love to play. I love people. I love golf. You know, it's been my whole life's journey and um, it's been a great journey, a grateful journey. And uh, I've been fortunate to hang out with the best players and teachers in the world. So uh, something's got to wear off somehow, sometime. Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, bring the listeners up to speed on you, if, if you would, just a little two <laughs> to three minute, two to three minute background. I'm sure a lot of people know who you are, but I think it's fascinating to hear kind of how you got into golf, how you got into tournament golf since it's such, been such a big part of your life and just kind of bring us through kind of, you know, a little shortened version of where you got to where you are now. Yeah, you know, what's funny is uh, really I got into golf um, caddying, the lost art of caddying. Like, you know, um, people are going to probably punch me in the nose, man, I wish there were more caddies, you know, more people get into golf that way. Um, that would be great. I think it's a great way to exercise. I think it's a great way to understand who you are in between shots, but that's how I got into golf caddying. And I was always like the runt of the litter. I hung out with people that were better than me, older than me, stronger than me. It was like, man, I'm going to catch that guy. I'm going to beat that guy. And so it gave me a vision for who I wanted to be in golf. Right. And during my um, pilgrimage in golf, it was kind of like trial and error. And so, um, you know, people would teach and things like that, but, you know, it was, it was more trial and error. And then um, I played college golf and, and I wouldn't let go. I played basketball and golf. And um, I kind of broke different things playing basketball that hindered my golf. But I, then I ended up at Seattle University um, playing golf, uh, got in that uh, Seattle University Athletic Hall of Fame. And I really wasn't like a college All-American or anything, but you know, I, I have uh, lots of clients that are really smart. And this lady who wrote a couple of books, she said, you know, you can have smarts and intelligence. You need to have creativity to, to be successful. But if you don't have the third element, the first two don't do you any good. Smarts and creativity are great. But if you don't have the third element, it doesn't do you any good. And I go, what is that? What is that? She said, perseverance. And I go, mm -hmm. one thing I do have is perseverance, right? And so I've had so many failures, some successes, um, but I've definitely persevered. And so, so then I started playing the mini tours and um, I've loved my wife since she is 18 years old. Um, we've been married 44 years now. And um, we, we traveled every state, but Alaska playing mini tours and the tour got my PGA tour card in 1985. Um, I know Phil Mickelson was my standard bearer at age 14, my first tour event. So he still calls me Mr. Costin. So I hope we get paired together in the scene beer. So, this year and I remember that he said uh, I was the only grandpa in the PGA championship in 2011 and 12 and he goes hey old man you're still doing it but I ain't going to carry your <laughs> I'm going to kick your butt <laughs> Dustin Johnson and Ricky Fowler and Davis I go what are you talking about and so then he told him the story so um, I was on and off the regular tour one on what is now the Corn Ferry Tour you know great players my locker was next to Crenshaw and Sebi Ballesteros Tom Lehman is a great friend of mine, Kenny Perry, Barb Bryant, um, Payne Stewart. We played a lot of golf together before I ever wore a pair of knickers. I, I say that, uh, and then in 1994, um, my wife just wasn't having a great time on the tour. You know, I drug her through the mini tours. And, and so I just walked away from the tour. I, was, I had a tour card, walked away from the tour because that family relationship and that marriage is hugely important to me. And so that was the hardest decision in my life. And then I started my golf academy at Simiemu. I've been there 26 plus years. And so I'm, and uh, Mike Bender and I, Mike Bender teaches Zach Johnson. We, uh, we've been doing golf schools together for almost 25 years. So I keep saying they're going to make a teacher out of me yet. Mike Adam 
has been a huge influence on my teaching and my golf. Mike Bennett and Andy Plummer have been amazing cousins in my golf. And I would never be the player or teacher I am without those guys. So I'm picky, but, um, uh, you know, I, I may not be that smart, but I hang out with smart people. I've been player of the year in the Northwest section 24 times. So I don't know if that makes me old or what that <laughs> means. But I know that when you and I were hitting balls together uh, not too long ago, you said, Jeff, why do you keep doing this? You know what I mean? And and I, I had to think for a second, man, just in the fiber of my being, you know, I mean, yeah. been my life's journey to figure out there's lots of ways to do it. But in my world, um, what's the best way? And so that's kind of where I am. And I still love to play golf and shot 66 last Friday, shot 69 was low yesterday. Today, I didn't quite get it done, but man, I wish the tournament was like right now I go play in the dark. <laughs> yeah, what man, a that's incredible. Yeah, no, I mean, just listen to you talk about what you've been through. Um, you know, I I've spent a lot of time with you and I've just been always super impressed uh, with your work ethic, uh, with, you know, your dedication to practice, your dedication to the mental game. Uh, just hearing about your consistency over the years. I mean, what was that sacrifice like you know, to, to travel around in the car from mini tour to mini tour. I mean, what, what is that mindset to know I'm going to make it like, cause there's probably a lot of doubt in those moments I would imagine, or is it, or is there never any doubt and you just kind of know you're on the right track to, to get into the ultimate goal, which is the PGA tour. Like, how do you, how do you stay focused in such a situation where I feel like that's pretty daunting to a lot of mini tour players or people thinking about getting to the professional tour? Yeah, you know what's interesting is like playing these mini tours I am right now, like <laughs> I'm 65 years old, don't tell anybody, but I'm the old, like 30, 35 years, right? And so, um, but I, I take that as a challenge, right? Like before I teed it up today, I worked out for an hour and 40 minutes, right? Um, and so, I mean, I just find a joy in that and just trying to find a joy, like we talked about that perseverance piece, that's one. And I think another big thing for me is like, what makes the golf ball do what it does, right? What makes that golf ball do what it does? Because the golf ball doesn't lie and the mm -hmm. video, lie, but my feelings lie. You know, I mean, like I, I, I'm working with a lot of mini tour players down here and played with a couple of them today. In fact, three of them today. And, um, but they always say, well, I feel like this, or for me, it does this. I know, but, but really the golf swing comes down to physics, geometry, lines, and angles. And then the, the, but for me personally, it was like, why didn't I make it on the PGA Tour? And why did my friends? And so it was like, I remember I'm um, on the mini tours, Tom Lehman said, Jeff, you know, you're a better athlete than me. You practice harder. You have a better swing than me. But I beat you seven out of 10 times because you don't know how to play the game. And that ticked mm. me off. So one of my pilgrimages is like, OK, well, I definitely know how to play the game now. Right. And so I took that as a challenge rather than, oh, you stink, Jeff. You know what I'm saying? And and we all have to overcome scar tissue. But I think, you know, then I was, um, you know, sought out like every all those sports psychologists have white jackets for me, like Bob Rotella, Deborah Graham, Chuck Hogan, David Cook, Fred Shoemaker, you know, Rick Jensen. You know, I mean, they all got white jackets for me because it was like, I'm going to pick their brain because I'm going to figure out how why, whether it's the golf swing with Mike Adams, Mike Bender, Bennett and Plummer, and, um, and my own stuff. And, and then, or like asking Crenshaw, what makes you a great putter? And, and of all the dozens of people I asked about what makes you a great putter, only one said anything mechanical. You know what I mean? Mm. And putting is probably 80% art and 20% technique, where the golf swing is probably 80% technique, 20% art. And I think that but it all starts from within. Do I believe? Can I see the shot? Can I control my club face? Can I have some fun in between shots instead of grind my tail off and look like I've been sucking green persimmons all day? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the goal is, like I say this, the golf shot is like a chocolate cake. Everybody likes chocolate cake. But so you have chocolate, you know, that's the technique, but you don't just hit a golf shot or make a chocolate cake with chocolate only. You have other ingredients, eggs, flour, sugar, water, right? But the eggs could be your commitment. The flour could be your shot shape and controlling your shot shape. That's what Tom Watson said. Jeff, master a shot shape. Jack Nicholas told me, hey, Jeff, straight is an accident. And I took that to say, yeah, when I have my A game, when I can see the flag, touch the flag, taste the flag, that's 10% of the time. Tom Watson said, Jeff, you could win a tournament with your C game. 
but you just got to curve your ball more. And Jack Nicholas said, yeah, Jeff, practice not crossing your line. So it's like, what the heck are they talking about? But it's like, okay, I'm going to do those things. And through the years, I've learned to achieve those and teach people to do that to where there's joy in the game, right? And so I think that's part of the piece. I learned that from Fred Shoemaker, to have some joy in the game. Who are you in between shots, Jeff? Like today it was like, I was like 100 and I made a triple bogey on the easiest hole in the history of golf. And it's like, Jeff, how are you going to respond? You're going to respond by get, like everybody else and get mad and ruin your day? Or are you going to respond, you know, in adversity, like a tour player, like somebody, because your days are numbered, bro. So if you don't stand up and, you know, cowboy cowgirl up and, and shine that on and let's see what you're made of today, man. You know what I mean? I broke, I birdied two of the next three holes because of my attitude mindset and cutting loose of what people thought of me, the score. Oh, I blew this this hard. So I'm usually the only guy that goes and practices after my rounds. Right. I was a mouthful. So uh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Jeff, that's an awesome story. And Holy smokes. Have you learned from the greatest players and instructors, mentors, you know, psychologists in the game of golf. Um, I'm curious, you, you mentioned something early on there that really struck a chord with me and it had to do with the golf swing being based on physics, geometry, angles, and then yeah. playing the game. And early on, yeah. you felt like you had the swing and then you needed to learn the game and now you own that. And, and I want to know how you decipher the two. Obviously, they're both complex subjects, but I want to know if you can kind of outline those both for us and how they differ. Right. So if you looked at my golf clubs and Keith has seen my golf clubs, you know, I wear out, you know, like a dime in the center of the face. Would you agree, Keith? I would, uh, I would attest to that. (laughs) That's a good one to do. (laughs) So then, but, but it's like, well, why is it, nobody ever told me why my ball went left. I felt like if my ball didn't go left, I could trust more. Right. So, so it's like, that's why I said trial and error. And that's why Bender and I, we're, we're trying to make the golf, the game of golf more simple, right? And have accountability. We're accountability partners in what we teach. So, so if, I, if I knew when my ball didn't go left, then I had more trust. But what comes first, right? And so I just thought I need to make, make a better golf swing. But really, I just needed to control my club face, number one. And I didn't understand the complexity of the mind, right? Like... Like I have, Chuck Hogan used to say, and he was a great influence on me, images are me. I am what I think I am, right? So if, mm-hmm. if, if anorexic, they think that they're overweight and they're not doing themselves any good by not eating, right? But we are what we think we are. Like I, I felt like everybody was bigger than me and better than me. And so I had to overcome that, right? Because I came from kind of a, a, a bad upbringing and most guys on the tour had a, had a great upbringing or a great, um, you know, family life. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, okay, I had to get that piece. Like, who am I? And, and do I deserve this? My first tournament on the tour, I'm six under after 10 holes and I'm leading the tournament. And this thought comes to me and it's wrong and it's erroneous thinking. And I need to change the movie of that thought. It said, it's not supposed to be this easy. You're just Jeff mm. Cost. This term is not supposed to be this easy, but the truth was that was just a glimpse of my true potential. And so mm-hmm. all I need to step into that. And so, or then how could I be, a lot of times I think, man, I have this putt. And it's like, how would Steph Curry shoot this with a basketball? Like he trusted, he'd see it. I'm gonna imagine I'm Steph Curry when I hit this putt. And so that changes the images of me, right? I remember all these all Americans. And like I said, I wasn't an all American. And we were playing the mini tour and I was, you know, I'm just being straight up, man. I was intimidated. Why should I be? I'm bigger, stronger, but I just didn't see my that. So I had to affirm, Jeff, you can do this, man. It ain't that big a thing. I made the PGA tour so big and I felt so small. So, so after this mini tour, all these all Americans were going to go play basketball. And so it's like, I had scholarship to play college basketball. So we're playing basketball and I am torturing these guys. Right. And so it's like, Jeff, look at that guy with that belly. You think that he's better than you? You know what I mean? And so I'm not saying that's the best way to do things, but, but to, (laughs) 
what makes you great and walk in that, that's part of being successful. I went eight under par the last 10 holes of a tour school and got my tour card. But it didn't dawn on me that you are a bad dude, man. So I started to affirm, Jeff, it's okay to be great. Jeff, it's okay to be a BMW ultimate driving machine. Jeff, it's okay that your putter's your lightsaber, man. You're Luke Skywalker, you're Steph Curry. And so understanding those pieces helped me. Another interesting thought was, why did I have the lowest stroke average in 1992 on what's now the Corn Ferry Tour on the weekend of anybody? And I made 65% of the cuts, right? Why was that? Because I had fears and doubts about missing the cut. And then I was free on the weekend. I had the lowest stroke average on the tour. So I had to fear, figure out, well, Jeff, how could you not make the cut the issue? And then I go, well, if you shoot five under every 36 holes, you'll never have to worry about the cut again. What do you have to do to do that? Well, man, you got to get the par fives. You get eight opportunities at par fives and you can reach two of them a day. So if you play those par fives six under and you got four wedge holes a day, and if you can get your nine iron into your wedge bundle and stuff it there and, and make three birdies there in 36 holes, you're just shooting nine under. You never, you don't have to make a birdie with a seven iron unless you feel it. And so you don't have to make I, birdie with a three iron. And so you could just curve your ball more like Tom Watson says, and it's became so much easier with affirming the strategies, the visualization, the controlling the club face. And I was a different human being. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's interesting. I see, I totally get where you're coming from and the whole perseverance thing is coming through pretty strong. I'm curious, was there a time or a person or something that entered your life that cause you to make those changes? Right. I, I would say all these people, I would say the tour players I've mentioned, you know, I remember Tom Lehman um, used to babysit my kids and stuff, and he's still a good friend. We don't see each other as much as we used to. Um, Kenny Perry is amazing. Um, and like I said, <clears throat> all those people, Tom Kite, all those people, I'd ask them questions, but Lehman and I had a relationship, Kenny Perry and I, Bart Bryant, you know, Payne Stewart, um, Paul Azinger. Do you know what I mean? And, and, um, but, you know, just implementing what Bob Rotella said, you know what I mean? Um, David Cook, I've, I've been on the phone with David Cook here, even in the last couple of weeks, he wrote that book, Seven Days of the Lynx Utopia, you know, the see it, feel it, trust it, but going deeper, I met David Cook at the Kansas Open. We're sitting in my van before anybody knew about him, right? And, and he was a disciple of Bob Rotella, but um, implementing all those things. I remember an interesting thing. Okay. So, 1988, before anybody was born, that's probably listening right now, but <laughs> I'm on the I was born. <laughs> what's that? I was born. <laughs> so I'm on the range at the Anheuser-Busch Classic. It's Wednesday afternoon. We play Thursday and I would just torture it in practice rounds. Right. And so I'm hitting balls and Tom Watson and Lanny Watkins walk up to me at the corner of the range and go, how do you ever shoot over par? You know, and it's like, you know, I, we've been watching you hit balls, man. How do you ever shoot over par? It's a joke. And so it's like, oh, man. Oh, hallelujah. They think I'm good, right? <laughs> I teed it up on the next day. It's par 71. I shot 75, four over par. I'm in last place, 156th place. I call Chuck Hogan on the phone. I'm crying on the phone. I don't have to go hit balls. Lanny Watkins says I'm a bad dude. I'm going to miss another cut. <laughs> and, so, and so Chuck Hogan said, Jeff, you just don't have permission to be great, man. You need to walk around bush gardens and give yourself permission that it's okay for you to be great. Everybody knows you can be except you. And the most important mm. thing is you. And so I did that. So I stood on the first tee the next day and said, Jeff, it's okay to start this ball at that bunker and cut it off that bunker and hit it in the fairway. You do this every day. And so I did that. Boom. Hey, Jeff, stuff this eight iron, man. You do it on the range every day. Boom. I, I choked on the last homemade bogey and I shot 67 and made the cut on the nose. I did the same thing the next day playing with Steve Thomas, who was leading the tour in driving distance with wooden drivers at 288 yards. And so um, I shot 65 that day. And the last day I'm playing with a friend of mine, Russ Cochran from Paducah, Kentucky, great athlete. I shot 67. And so I finished seventh. That's my best turn on the PGA Tour. I went from 156 to seventh. And, and I played good the next week and I kind of had it, but then I didn't realize that I didn't own it. And then I was back to trying to not miss a cut. How can you putt when you're trying not to miss it? 
How can you make a foul shot when you're trying not to miss it? And you're worried about all the fans or the cheerleaders or the college coaches or whatever. And you, nobody can play golf that way. And, and nobody can play golf trying to make it. You just have to do your routine, see it, feel it, trust it, and go. And so it didn't stick with me. But then I talked to another person a long time later, 15 years later, he said, a different guy, hey, Jeff, you just don't have permission to be great. Everybody knows how great you can be except you. And I owned it that day and I'll never forget it. And so it got branded on my heart. And we all need to have those aha moments. You know, we haven't talked about swing technique or anything yet. I, I'm hopefully this is a three hour podcast, but, but, <laughs> but, but you have to own it. Tom Lehman, a good friend of mine, um, in 1990 for the 1991 tour, he had to birdie the last hole to make the 72 hole cut. The pins cut on the right, surrounded by water. Tom's a hard drawer. A friend of ours, Dudley Logan, who caddied for me when I went eight under par the last 10 in 87 is caddying for Tom. And Dudley caddied for me on the Champions Tour in 2015. And Dudley says, you are a champion, man. Act like a champion. Hit this shot like a champion. And Tom got up there and he hit it three and a half feet. We had dinner that night. He grabbed the divot and he yelled at the top of his lungs. I am a champion. I will never doubt myself again. I don't care whether I make or miss that putt. I will never doubt myself again. He threw the divot down, made the putt, didn't get on the tour, got on what's then the Hogan tour, as did I. And then he won three times on the Hogan tour, was player of the year. And then he went on to be Tom Lehman. That one shot changed his life because he owned it. Costin went eight under par for 10 holes. Costin did all this. He did that. He did this but he didn't own it. I feel like I'm, I've stepped in to owning it. Now I need to learn, relearn, but own it. And we all can do that no matter who we are or what we're doing, what level we are. We could say it could be somebody that wants to be a single digit. You need to make a plan to do that. You know, set goals. If we're starting a business together, we're not going to just go out there and sell hot dogs on the street corner. We're going to make a business plan to how to be successful. But I don't think that people that want to be better at golf do that enough. The accountability, the, you know, coaches should coach them how to practice and say, oh, I got an hour, three days a week. Well, this is what I want you to do for those hours, three days a week, right? And then we're going to check on this, right? And, and make a plan because everybody just kind of spins their wheels and they, and they don't move from point A to point Z. You know what I mean? And I think that we could all get better. And we're all supposed to get better. And I think that we can make golf easier, but it does start from within. And that starts from good technique, starts from proper practice and, you know, all the above. Woo. Let's go, (laughs) man. That was awesome. Um, So something I really admire about you, obviously I've been in the section, the the Northwest section for, you know, five years now. And, uh, you know, since I've been around, you've been winning tournaments right? That seems to be a pretty common theme, right? Death taxes and Jeff Costin wins a couple tournaments a year. (laughs) So um, that comes with consistency. I think consistency is one of the biggest things we get asked as instructors, correct? People want more consistency. But Henry and I have been really talking about this topic. And we said, if you want consistency, you better be doing things consistently, right? And it sounds like you've started to live that or have been living that for a long time. So in order to maintain your level of, of consistent golf, you know, Mm -hmm. what are some things that you do on a daily basis, a weekly basis that the listeners could kind of glean some, some little nuggets from. Right. I I think that let's just talk about a golf swing for now. We haven't touched Mm -hmm. base. Right. So (sighs) I, I, I feel like most teachers teach from opinion or tips. Mm. I teach physics and principles. And yep. so if I'm more consistent, I, number one, chapter one would be, man, I, I have to aim consistently. I got to understand yeah. what it does and I have to buy into it. Like Zach Johnson um, works with Bender. Like I said, I introduced Bender to his wife on a blind date. You know, they're still married. He's still talking to me. And I met him in 1981. We played the mini tours. And it was like, it was like, he was, he and I'd be the first guys there and the last guys to leave. And we'd be in playoffs. We just beat each other up. And then it's like, Hey man, do you want to play a practice round? It's like, yeah, sure. And then you, Hey, you want to, you want to stay together next week? Yeah, sure. And then it was like, we're buddies. Right. And then, and so it's like amazing to still be, you know, 40 some years later, as close to friends we are. 
So Zach Johns went to Drake University. He's third man. People don't even know where Drake University is, right? And so now he's like made 40 some million dollars, Ryder Cup, Masters, the Open Champion. It's like, why? He stuck with a process and a program, right? And so I think people need to do that. They're going for the flavor of the month on the Golf Channel or Golf Digest. I remember Bender writing articles for Golf Digest and he says, how you guys, why don't you do something consistent in there so people can follow along? And they said, we don't want to do that. We want to have all kinds of opinions because that sells magazines, right? We want to kind of confuse people because that sells magazines. They're looking for a tip, you know, of the month, right? So this is what I think. Physics 101 says anything swung to its fulcrum and axis swings on orbit faster. I have more speed and stays on orbit longer. I'm more on plane. It's like a tetherball going around a tetherball pole. Whoever's played tetherball before, when it doesn't go 90 degrees, that tetherball pole is all wibbly wobbly. That would be out of orbit and slow, and it slows down. And, and so it's like, that's like the golf swing. So step one, besides, hey, I need to aim properly and have a proper grip and ball position. That's like golf 101. I need to swing on a proper plane. It's like if the golf ball was teed up chest high, you would swing in a circle right? If it's teed on the ground, it's still a circle on an incline. It's like if you turn, if you tilt your spine forward, you still swing in a circle on an incline. So you have to have three-dimensional depth. You come from the inside back to squared impact and back around on the, on the other side of the golf ball. Just a side note, no, but very few people ever teach what happens on the other side of the golf ball. Because if you're poo-poo on the other side of the golf ball, you're starting to get poo-poo on this side of the golf ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> So Correct. I reckon like I still hit the ball far. I reckon it like ping pong. If you hit a speed producing cross court top spin forehand in tennis or ping pong, that's a speed producing angle of attack. And the ball results in that. If you cut across it, it's a speed reducing angle of attack. And that's how most people hit a golf ball. And so it's like, yeah, man, if I could teach somebody and convince them how to swing you know, from depth, because I'm not Inspector Gadget, my arms don't extend, I don't swing on a straight line, I swing in a circle on an incline around my target line. Chapter two. Mm -hmm. Chapter three would be, okay, now through the hitting zone, if I could control the club face and have forward lean to the shaft and practice impact and what that face does and where my hands and body are at impact, now golf becomes so much easier if I could have that mental piece, the strategical piece, the technical piece, that's like my chocolate cake. You know what I mean? And so it's like, I do lots of seminars for the section and different people. Like I had 36 teaching pros. This was a couple of years ago. And I said, how many think impact is the most important part of the swing? Raise your hand. And 36 people raised their hand. And I said, how many of you teach and or practice impact, raise your hand. Zero people raise their hand. And I said, well, hopefully you don't charge for your golf lessons, right? So <laughs> in the Northwest, somewhere where the weather's bad, if I can help people do some things at home or in front of a mirror that they could do at home, man, they send me a Christmas card. You know what I mean? And so it's like, because if I hit a hundred golf balls, which most people don't, it takes less than a second and a half to hit a golf ball. So you're practicing for 150 seconds. That's less than three minutes of practice, actual practice. But if I'm rehearsing and working at impact and building my awareness, connecting the myelin in my brain, you know, of something I'm trying to do, not just doing it to do it, but do it like, how am I getting that face square or slightly open if I come on playing? And then how am I getting my hands forward? And if I could rehearse that with a golf ball, you know, in my think box behind, you know, I'm stealing vision 54 um, in my think box and then walk into my play box and have a reactive routine, start my ball somewhere and curve it and practice that way. So play is no different than practice and practice is no different than play. And I can figure out who I'm in between shots and have a strategy and work on this golf swing consistently. Man, then I get somewhere. Then I have some hope because everybody has to have hope and, and, you know, and I can set up a swing station, Keith, that you know that I do that all the time for somebody at home, for somebody, you know, on the driving range, right? And, and they could hit 10 balls in that swing station because if they don't feel what they're supposed to do, it's hard to make a change because it feels so weird, but that's why we look on the video camera when Bender and I do golf schools. 
hey, the first day of the golf school, I don't care what your ball goes as much as if you can make the change that looks good on the video camera. Day two, then we work on your golf ball. If that makes sense, can I get an amen or something? Oh, me or amen. something. <laughs> yeah. Keith and I are huge on all three of your main points, swinging the club in a circle, swinging it along the target line on plane, impact conditions, what the golf club is doing to produce ball flight. Mm-hmm. I, I teach golf instruction and golf for a living. I work for the NMSU PGA golf management program. And I talk about impact laws every day and mm-hmm. walk around looking like I have two heads on. Um, why is impact and club positions so foreign? I mean, Keith and I were looking at the most recent Golf Digest magazine and all the tips that were in this one portion that we were looking at, we're talking about ways to do things with the golf ball that had nothing to do with the golf club. They were talking about mm-hmm. the hips and the pelvis and things of that nature. Why are we not talking about impact and the club and the ball? I would say, and don't tell my wife this, I would say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but it, it is crazy because ultimately, here's another question. Why is it in every sport except golf, having great hands is an asset? Hockey, basketball, baseball, man, that guy has great hands. Man, that girl has great hands. But in golf, it's like you mentioned hands and it's like, boo, man, I'm out of here, right? But yeah. it's the thing that connects us with the golf club. And wherever I turn my wrists, the golf club responds also. And with the golf club, I have mass on the end of a fulcrum. It wants to turn over, right? And so if I could get a semblance for somebody, let's say that, you know, they don't, they hit a pull fade or a pull hook or something. If I could get them swinging on plane and swinging your arms, right? That's another thing. If somebody, if I had a lot of times with my lessons, I have somebody walk, just walk. I say, just walk down to, you know, 50 yards and do what I say. And I don't know if Keith's been around when I've done that before. And I say, just walk. And I say, swing your arms faster. They walk faster. Hmm. I say, turn around, walk to me, swing your arms slower. They walk slower. And I say, what happened? They said, I walked faster. I said, how'd you do that? I never thought about it, right? So what I'm saying is, got this from Mike Adams. Anatomically, we're designed that my body responds to my arms. Like when you broad jump, you swing your arms and then you jump. You don't jump and then swing your arms. When you pitch, you swing your arms and then you move. When you shoot a jump shot in basketball, you swing your arms. You don't jump and then swing your arms unless you're Dick Barnett for the New York Knicks before you guys were born. But, but your body anatomical. So why do golf teachers teach start with your lower body? You'd be like a baseball player fooled on a changeup. And then you have to release the club early and you never have forward lean to the shaft because the club has to travel 170 degrees or if you're swinging to parallel 180 degrees, but your hips travel maximum 90 degrees at impact. So your arms and the club better come down or you're out of sequence. And so you look like an octopus falling out of a tree or something, right? Instead of you're trying to relink, that's why pitching is easy because your arms don't travel much further than your body and they're all linked up. So you can stay super duper connected and all that kind of jazz, you know what I'm saying? But practicing impact, and the purpose would be face and forward lean the shafts. But if I'm not, I reckon it as the club head is a, is a tidal wave and my hands are the surfer. I do not want the tidal wave to pass the surfer and drown the surfer. I want the surfer to win to the ball and the beach, which is probably waist high on the other side of the golf ball. And so that, like, that's an image somebody could relate to. Or, you know, chopping down a tree. I'd throw my back out if I started, you know, with my lower body. But it makes logical sense you know, my, the club head travels 180 degrees, my hips, you know, my lower body travels 90 at the most. When I'm at impact, my shoulders should be square. So they've traveled 90, if I've made a 90 degree turn on the backswing. So man, I don't want to be out of sequence or I can't have forward lean and to the shaft and correct and um, compress the golf ball. Does that make sense? And if somebody's, total sense. Wait, yeah. And the steeper somebody is, the sooner the club releases, it's physics, right? The shallower somebody is, the more that there's lag and the club, that lag is the club doesn't release early. So now if I'm steep, you know, I'm triple messed up. I'm aimed to the right. I got a weak grip and I'm steep and I'm swinging on a line. So it's like, man, I got no chance. Right. And then it's like, but, but you know, that would be huge. Swinging on plane from the inside, like the tether ball around the tether ball pole that's tilted on an incline. Right. Controlling the club face with forward lean to the shaft. 
And I think teachers don't realize they teach that because Ben Hogan wrote a book called The Five Fundamentals of Golf. And he said, I start from the ground up. And so he was an icon. They don't even know why they teach that. It's just like different guys go, hey, straight left arm. Hey, keep your head down. Hey, slow your swing down. Those are all poo-poo. I don't mind a straight left arm. I mean, but Calvin Pete did pretty good when he had his arm fused, bent. You know what I'm saying? And so, so it's like, but Hogan didn't do what he felt like. Like Jeff Costin feels like he rips his legs. But if you saw my swing on video, I get my arms down to relink like Mo Norman or Sam Snead or, you know, Adam Scott or whatever. And then I fire, but I feel like I drive my legs. Right. So Hogan read the book. But if you saw a front, a front view, caddy view of Ben Hogan, he slid just like Mo Norman and Sam Snead. He had leg separation. He relinked his arms down and everything was in sequence. And then he fired his legs like nobody's business. But what feels not always real, and you can't confuse comfort with being correct. Costing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I, we, we, Henry and I talk about this stuff ad nauseum all the time. I mean, everything you're talking about, and what's really cool to hear you speak about it is just how convicted you are about what you're trying to do with a golf club and how it moves along a target line and how you align yourself it sounds like you're really in love with like the process of hitting good shots and the result is secondary. You know, I've, I've been in your teaching studio and you have something that I've taken with me at heart, which is you have a little thing frame that says N A T O it's an acronym for not attached to the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really eye opening. And it sounds like, you know, the outcome of the shot is kind of secondary. Obviously you visualize the shot you want to hit and you set yourself up accordingly. That's what the setup process is for to set the face, set the alignment, set the ball position, all that sort of stuff. But if talk us through a little bit about the visualization piece, if you would, because I know you, you really mentioned that like creating a moment on the range, you know, mm -hmm. people are just out there banging balls and they have no idea why the ball's going offline. Well, they haven't even created the shot in their mind, nor do they have any chance of setting the shot up in their address position. And you speak a lot about, you know, seeing the ball flight, creating the shot. So when you're playing your best golf, which is quite often uh, from what I uh, gather, um, how in, you know, like, what is that like for you in your head? Like, what are you seeing? Are you seeing shot shapes like the tracers on television? Are you, is it a feeling in your hands? Like, what is that like? Yeah, so, so several things. Um, I do see that shot tracer. Um, I, I do see that. And so it's, it, it's interesting because when I was younger, they said, hey, man, you got to see the shot and visualize the shot, see the ball bounce and roll in the hole. And that's not who I am. I just see it like that shot tracer, boom, that quick, right? And so it's like, if I try to take too much time, the picture goes away. People have to find out what that is. And, and we process, the best computer ever made is on our shoulders. So somebody says, well, I can't think about this in my golf swing. I have to have a blank mind. I don't know anybody that has a blank mind, honestly. Only that 10% when, you know, when you're just dead nuts got it. But I, I, I rehearse because everybody has flaws and tendencies in their swing. And so I, if, if, if I have a blank mind, which I wouldn't call visualization a blank mind, that's part of the skill, right? And mm -hmm. so it's like, but I, I practice, like I said, I see the shot. I practice a zone. If I have my A game, let's say I'm hitting a seven iron. Another thing is people need to own a shot shape. Like I said, Tom Watson said, a, a tour player averages 16 feet, two inches from the hole from 125 yards, but a, a 12 handicap is trying to hit his ball right at the flag stick. And I go, man, that's not right, man. And so it's like, you got to give yourself more room. Like if somebody, let's say that they're a fader, like, and they're, and they got to hit a green. Start at the left side of the green and fade in the middle of the green until you know that you got it going on and own that shot shape because you'll never get hurt by hitting it pin high in the middle of the green. That, that would be something. What I see when I'm at my very best, I just see like a bowling alley or a hallway and I hit it down the hallway and I see my shot tracer and I, I pick a, a, a branch on a tree where I start my golf ball and to the flag. Or if I don't have it going on, like today, it was like, hey, there was a flag cut on the very right. And so I started the flag and I curved to the middle of the green with a five iron, right? Because I don't have to stuff a five iron unless I feel it, right? But I, but I saw the, um, the bowling alley or the, or the um, hallway 
going down at the flag and I saw my endpoint. That's huge. Another huge thing is um, when you're on the range, it seems easier. Why is that? Because there is no interference. That's Fred Shoemaker. So it's like, what is interference? Water, wind, people, TV cameras, um, club championships, you know, um, like Lee Trevino, he said, I felt more pressure to make a cut than to win a tournament because I knew at least I'd finish second. So, so it was like, but, but it's like, how do I overcome interference? By commitments, by speaking your shot. Like when my friend Kurt Caddy's for me, I say, Kurt, man, I'm going to take this seven iron, hit me a three quarter seven iron at that lady in the red, at that TV tower and curve it into the flag. I do this every day. I'm going to control my club face with the hitting area and I'm going to make a tour sound. It ain't going to be no grandpa. And so, and so I speak the shot that takes away the interference and I have a start line endpoint and then I stand up and do it. And then I grade my shots on my commitment and my visualization and my path and face. It doesn't have to be 80 things I have to do, right? Everybody has to master about seven things. And so then I could move on and improve. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. So it sounds like there at the end, you're saying you're not grading so much. Did the ball do what I wanted it to? But was I committed? Did I have a really clear picture in my mind? And that's sort of like 85% of the battle. Yes. And so it's hard because like when, like when I, when I, like I said today, I made a triple bogey on an easy golf hole. Don't tell anybody. Okay. And so, <laughs> so, but the next, the, then I said, Costin, who are you going to be, man? You're going to be like everybody else. You're going to be extraordinary. And so I've trained myself by affirming Jeff, it's okay to be extraordinary. Like I, I didn't feel that in 1985 when I was leading the tournament. You know what I mean? So it's like, hey man, I'm better, better late than never. You know what I'm saying? And so, so it's like, okay, so I birdie two of the next three holes. That was fun, right? And so, but it's hard to let go of that triple bogey on a peanut little hole. I mean, I never do that, right? I'm still angry. You could ask my wife, but, but, <laughs> but like, but it used to like, dictate my worth and value rather mm. than it, it's still I still struggle with it or because because it's important to me but I need to be able to balance out and and it's crazy and you've experienced this how bad people talk to themselves when you're oh given a gosh or it's like it's redunculous you know what I mean and so yeah or you do a video and they go before you ever evaluate, you just put it in, in your computer and they go, I can't believe I'm still doing that. And I go, hey, man, when you go to the dentist and he looks at your x-ray, you saying, I can't believe I got black in my teeth. No, you let the guy talk. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and, then, and then, you know, as a teacher, we need to say what people are doing well also. Man, you're doing this so much better, man. I love your grip, man. Your posture looks like a tour player. I mean, you don't lie to them, but you got to give people, you know, a vitamin here too. You know, it's like, like when they hit a shot, right. And say, let's say they have a good swing and they kind of overdraw it and they just launched it. You know, I go, man, you hear that sound? You didn't have that sound last week. That's a pure sound. Fixing that's going to be easy. We just got to control the club face and lead with a handle four frames through the, through the hitting zone a little bit longer. And you got this thing, man. And you know what I mean? And it's like, man, I got to put on my white collar sometimes, you know what I mean? To get people out of the toilet. You know, I've said, <laughs> would you caddy for me and say that to me, bro? You know what I mean? It's like, come on, you know? And so we, we're constantly judging ourselves, and we're constantly, we're constantly not only judging ourselves, we're still worried about what other people think and we're judging ourselves, And then, and then we're two shots away from going crazy. Like Fred Shoemaker would say, and, and if we're constantly doing that, how do we expect to attain or sustain extraordinary play or extraordinary life. Like if, if I talk to my grandkids like that, man, they, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't like me. I got another thing that thought. So I like to listen to what famous people say, whether they're actors, whether they're athletes or musicians. And I say this, and I'm just going to go for it. I wish I could say that about politicians, but, but um, yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for laughing. But, but, but um, Robin Williams, it was wonderful. He was, a, he was a street comedian and then he got a job doing Mork and Mendy. He just did his thing, right? And then, then he did great things like um, Dead Poets Society and Goodwill Hunting, great dramas. 
right? And so I watch him on this called Inside the Actor's Studio. If anybody wants a treat, they should watch that. Robin Williams, Inside the Actor's Studio. I watch that all the time when I'm working out. And so um, he says, I create a moment for the moment. And he goes, what, what, what? I, yeah, I create a moment for the moment. In front of the mirror, I create that moment for in front of the camera. I'm trying to create a moment for the moment. I go, that's what I do. I wish I would have said that when I was on the tour. That's what I do. On the range, I create a moment for the moment on the golf course. Like, like when I'm in my zone, what are you doing, Jeff? You know what I mean? Man, I'm free. I see it clearly. I have my path and face. I'm making great sounds and I'm having some fun. It's okay that golf is semi-fun. You know what I mean? And I was in a group today where we, there was no talking going on. It's like, man, this is supposed to be fun, bro. And, and I could be the worst at that at times, like years ago. And I am a competitor and I like to tear people's heart out and then buy them lunch afterwards. But, but I... I got to be my own best friend on the golf course. You know what I'm saying? And I got to create a moment when I'm by myself in the rain, practicing for a moment on the golf course, instead of just putting in my time. And you alluded mm -hmm. to that. So I have a start line and end point. When I don't have my A game, I make a bigger zone. And when I have my A game, which is only 10% of the time, I have a teeny zone. I probably have my B game 30% of the time, my C game 50% of the time. I've won tournaments with my C game because I just curve my ball more. Because I know that I can have my A, B, and C game and even my D game in one round. But if I expect to make every jumper like Steph Curry, if he misses a couple, he doesn't beat himself up and walk down the, down the, the, the court. He like, he says, well, I know I'm going to get this done. And so we need to talk good to ourselves in that regard also. Man, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Now, um, Henry and I were talking about this before we got on the, on the podcast with you here. We hit so many better shots when we actually set the stage for the shot before we even make a swing too many times we get caught on that range just pulling another ball into place and then we just get lost in kind of technique or maybe what we were doing wrong from swing to swing but it's so much it's so evident that when we step off a shot we see it happen we create the moment and we and we just engage in the act that we're about to do which is swing the golf club it's, it's scary how much better we hit it. And it's like, why don't we just practice? We were laughing about it. We were like, why don't we just practice that all the time? Isn't that what we want to do in tournaments? Isn't, right. we, isn't that just what we want to do? But we don't do it. And so, you know, for, for somebody out there who's listening, is that sort of like an advanced, you know, do you have to kind of work towards being able to do that? Is there a technique that comes first? Or do you encourage people to be working on, setting the stage for the shot while they're still developing their technique. Yeah, I think you could do both, honestly. And, and I'm not sure that people believe they can do that because a lot of times, you know, they'll read something where you have to have a blank mind or you can't think about technique, but I, I believe you can. And, and so that's why I would go, that's why once I cross over from my think box, to my play box, uh, that I'm more reactive, but I still see it going down the bowling alley and I still can th control my club face through the hitting zone. And everybody says, well, how can you do it? It happens so fast. But I mean, how am I talking right now? I'm not thinking about what I'm saying. It's in me. Right. And so I'm trying to develop something. It's a skill to be developed. Right. And so you have to see the validity in doing it, right. You got to have technique. It's like that chocolate cake again. You gotta have chocolate, but you gotta have the other ingredients. And I can't have, you know, like 18 times more chocolate and only one egg. That's not the right amount of ingredients. And the whole goal on the range and when you're your best, like, like what are the right amount of ingredients? And we have to help our students find that and hold them accountable to that and how to practice that, right? And you can do some of that at home also, right? And so um, I think that that's huge. Impact is huge, like we said. On plane is huge. Commitment is huge. Start lines, visual is huge. I remember my first year on the tour, <laughs> um, I had this guy, Carol West, caddying for me. I was 20 something, he's 40 something. And so it's kind of like a dad image to me. And so he's on my bag and, and he goes, Hey, pro, just start at that bunker, draw it off that bunker. I saw you do this on the range. I want you to start at that bunker and hit it into that telephone pole. And it's like, Yes, sir. But he gave me the image. And so, like, I remember I shot 71, 71, 70. And then I called, I, 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 this guy was going to call for my tea time. I said, man, I was feeling cocky. I said, man, I hope I play with a big name player tomorrow. 
And, and so he, he called and then he put down the phone. He said, well, Jeff, you got your issue point with Jack Nicholas tomorrow. And I go, oh, no, not that big a name. And so <laughs> the fourth round of the classic in 1985. Right. And and it's like I couldn't even get to the T. They thought I was a caddy or something. Right. So and so you played three times in those days. So it was Bobby Nichols was wonderful guy got hit by lightning so he was shaken and so he hit one down then they go so many times masters u.s open pga runner up british open bound da, 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 jack <laughs> and he ripped one down the middle and they go from kent washington jeff costner everybody starts walking away and so so it's like so i hit this good drive and and this guy carol was says we're gonna beat this old man today and he just kept saying we're gonna beat this old man today and he kept giving me the image he says Trust this putt. Just shoot this putt. You're a basketball player. Shoot this putt. And I shot 71 that day. And I, I had fun. I wasn't intimidated by Jack Nicholas because my guy, Carol West, wouldn't let me. And so that's, I didn't realize it, but that's what I do now. Like I said to Kurt, I speak my shot to Kurt, just like Carol West did to me, whatever, 37 years ago. I didn't get it until, until probably, who knows, 10 years ago. But that's important, right? And so also when you're hitting balls, it's like when you're hitting it perfect, I go, Jeff, it's okay to do that on the golf course, bro. It's okay to do that no matter what the situation. It's just a name of a tournament. It's no different than this. It's just a number in a seven iron. No club has power or personnel unless you give it to it. Just, just do this. Take less time. Think less. See it. You know, feel it. Trust it and go. Thank you, David Cook. And so it's like, and then it's like, then you're building a bank account of great shots to take to the tournament with you. And I mm -hmm. tell people, you know, let's say Keith at the Washington open, you and I and Shane Perrant, you're tied going into the last round. And I, I, I would tell somebody, Hey man, I can't, I can't think right all day, but I can do it for one hole 18 times. And I'm not going to be attached to the outcome and I'm going to be free and, and see this shot and I'm going to enjoy the journey because I'm on the back nine of life. And so I'm not going to limp across the finish line, you know, but I can do it within my game plan. You know what I mean? And one hole, one shot at a time. And I'm going to be who I need to be in between shots. And it'll be a challenge. And it seldom goes how we draw it up on the chalkboard, just like life. But I've learned that that's, that's what has to be. And I might have to curve my ball a lot for a while. And then, and then maybe for an hour, I might, you know, be able to taste that flag stick and go. Man, that's awesome. Well, we've taken up a lot of your time and we appreciate everything that you've had. Henry, you got anything else for this legend right here? Yeah, I got one more question for you, Jeff. Um, I'm ready. You've spent a lifetime on and, you know, on and around the tours and it sounds like you're down in Phoenix right now playing the mini tours and you've basically summarized three major skills that we need to have playing uh, uh, swing skills, playing mm -hmm. skills, and then mm -hmm. maybe life skills, mental, emotional, positive thinking kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are of current and past mini tour players who aren't quite on the tour and what's keeping them back. What are, what are the things that are limiting those players? Yeah, that's a great point. So like they had the Phoenix open pre-qualifier down here where I'm teaching at Lone Tree. And then obviously back at Simiamu April 1st. And um, so you look on the range, it could be the Washington open, it could be the screen door open, it could be the US open, it could be the toilet bowl, right? And so, and so everybody looks like they can hit it, right? College terms, everybody, whoa, 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 whoa. And people get intimidated by that, right? Oh, but, but some of those guys are gonna shoot 78. Some are gonna shoot 75, a couple of them are gonna shoot 67, 65, right? What separates them? When, when I used to four spot, I had success in four spot qualifiers. And it was like, you know, of the 140 guys or whatever, 50 of them don't belong there. So now I'm playing against 90 of them because they, they don't feel like they belong. Another 40 of them aren't gonna play very good because they, they are making too big a deal of it and they have no game plan and they're impatient and they don't have a conception. Like, like if you think about Bubba Watson, he controls his path and face however he wants because he's so creative, right? Or if you think about Matthew Wolf, he takes it up and out and then he gets his depth on the downswing with a big loop like Jim Furyk or Ryan Moore. Or you think about Ricky Fowler's laid off. Or you think about Dustin Johnson, um, 
what Butch Harmon did great is he, he never changed Dustin Johnson's backswing, but he slots it, right? And so they create, but through the hitting zone, they all look the same and they believe. Tour players believe, right? And so, so a mini tour player, like I say, you have to take the road less traveled. You can't do what everybody else is doing. There's too many good players. So you have to see the validity in commitment, in through the hitting zone path and face, in stuffing wedges where they can't hide the flag from you, in curving your golf ball, in understanding your ABC game, in understanding what your assets and liabilities are in your technique, right? And understanding that I got to be patient. And then I got to create a mindset. I got to trust. So I hit good shots. I can't wait till I hit good shots to trust. And I got to create a moment for the moment. So it's meshing that whole thing to get the right chocolate cake and take your road less traveled and persevere. Yeah, I, that's awesome. So what I'm taking from you today are, you know, some things we need to do. We need affirmations, right? I mean, that sounds like it's big. We need to believe and we need to, we need to keep telling ourselves how good we are, right? And it, it, it might sound like it's cocky or arrogant, but you know, no one else is going to do it for you. So it's got to be you, right? We got to be on plane in the swing and we got to control the face, right? right? We all know that we need to give ourselves permission. I think that's the biggest takeaway I'm going to have from today. And Henry and I have been talking about this in our own personal lives. It's, Hey, we, we're great, man. We know what we're talking about. We know what we're doing. We got to give ourselves permission to do it. And it sounds crazy and a little bit, you know, it's just a foreign concept to a lot of people, but I think it's really empowering when you give yourself permission to be great. And it sounds like that was something that you've learned in your quest to figure out why you didn't stay on the PGA tour is that, that permission piece to be great. And um, yeah, no, I, we, we appreciate you coming on and, uh, and learned just as, you know, more from you in an hour than I have, you know, from a lot of other people. So it's, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, man, I appreciate you guys having me. I enjoyed it, and um, I'm, I'm going to get this game yet because I, I may be on the back line, but I'm 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 running across the finish line, and and I ain't done yet. That's awesome, Jeff. It was nice meeting you. It was nice hearing your story. I thought, I mean, I, I can't wait to go back through and listen to this again because uh, you you dropped so much knowledge on us that uh, there's only so much paper that I have that I got to write it all down real quick. But uh, holy <laughs> smokes, are you? engaging, entertaining, and have some really, really deep messages of wisdom that all of us can take and implement. So thank you so much for being able to contribute to our, our show and our lives. Yeah, I said, yeah. I said, I got a lot of miles on me, but they're highway miles and I change my oil regularly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick before you go, uh, where can people find more info about you? I know you're teaching down in Phoenix right now, but uh, where in general can people uh, come to see you or find more on you? Yeah, you could look on my website, jeffcoston.com. I appreciate that, Keith. And also, I do a lot of things on Twitter. Um, I throw a few things down on Instagram, but I, if I kept doing that, I'd, I'd have no life. And I need another Instagram lesson from you. But uh, <laughs> they're in my website. But there's a few things on Instagram. You got it. All right, cool. Well, uh, everybody listening, go check out more on Jeff Coston. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll speak to you again in a future episode down the road because there's more to okay. learn from you. I'm, I'm sure of that. All right, guys. Thank you. Costin right. out. Costin <laughs> out. <laughs> See you, Jeff. See ya. Right. See you, buddy.